to get to the beginning here. Um, I'm glad to be back in what the, what about in Edinburgh, with, which you may know the Scots call Old Reeky, old smelly place. It's not it's not smelly anymore. They stopped coal smoke, um, and I have a sentimental uh, attachment to uh, I'm Scotland because back in the 1960s I was a folk singer. You know, that was the folk era. And uh, Ewan, Ewan McCall was a hero of mine, and I learned really all of Burns' songs, and et cetera, et cetera. Ye Jacobites, my name, give an ear, give an ear, ye Jack, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Harvard made me a, a Keynesian. I was an economist, I was a Harvard undergraduate, and, and then gradually started to outgrow it. Uh, Keynesianism, although I don't mean to insult the post Keynesian here. Um, I became in the 1960s and 70s a Chicago School Economist graduate. I taught there from 1968 to 80. At the time when Chicago was among the most creative economics departments in the world, Harvard was not. Harvard was at a low point then. They had hired a bunch of guys in the early 50s who didn't pan out. Whereas Chicago and uh, Cambridge, England, and MIT were the places where modern economics was being invented. Uh, you know, rational expectations, uh, economic history, efficient financial markets, law and economics was all being invented at Chicago in the 70s. And then slowly, slowly, although I've written a lot as a, as a Chicago school economist, and I'm sorry, offend some of you, but I am. Um, and I think supply and demand curves are, are very nice. Um, but slowly, slowly, I've, uh, I can't say put that aside, I haven't. I still believe in the, in, in, in the, tech, in the technical and um, uh, um, empirical findings of Chicago School Economics to some degree. But I've, I've gradually moved to what I'm now calling, and uh, compliments of uh, Bart, Bart Wilson, humanomics. Humanomics. Economics with the humans left in. And as I understand the, the papers here, although ma many of them are of mathematical and technical expression, which I, I don't mind at all. In fact, I don't want to be interpreted as being against mathematics. I think economists should use more mathematics, not less. It's the kind of math they use which is, which is a big mistake. But, so it's, it's, it's economics <coughs> in which they're actually uh, humans. I remember back in, in, in the 70s how thrilled we were at Chicago when the economists Wait a second, let me start this. Where is it? There it is. This is my timer. When it rings, you'll know I've run out of time. How thrilled we were when the economists at Texas A&M University showed that pigeons and rats were rational. They did. They showed that pigeons and rats maximize utility. Pigeons and rats satisfy the weak axiom of revealed preference. And at the time, it's like, hey, boy, that shows how powerful economics is. But actually, it shows there's something terribly wrong with this way of thinking of the world. Because think about this. Grass is rational. Grass maximizes subject to constraints. Seeks the light, seeks the water in the grassy way that it knows how. And that, that's rationality, according to economists. Now, I think that prudence, which is what rationality is, speaking in classical um, virtue ethical terms, is a good virtue. You don't want a society filled with imprudent people. But prudence only, as I've argued um, at length, is dangerous, is a misconstrual of what humans are like. And it's liable to, liable to get you into trouble. 
For example, we speak of lions as being courageous. Well, lions aren't courageous. <laughs> when they face an elephant, they run away. Needless to say, because they know they're going to lose this battle. Humans are courageous. Their virtues, courage, temperance, justice, faith, hope, and love, along with prudence, are human virtues. They're only conceivable for humans, at least for mortal, self-conscious beings, which is what we are. Uh, so a lion's not courageous, whereas the men from Scotland, indeed, who went over the top at the Somme, Battle of the Somme in, in July of 1916, that's courage. Now, I'm going to say some shocking things this, this afternoon, um, which I, I, I need to stir you up, but I'm not just you know, trying to be irritated. I'm, I'm saying things that I want you to consider seriously. That if you do it, you might change your mind about lots of things. The first and most important is that I'm beginning to think that economics is a policy science, which is the main subject of our conference, is an ethical and scientific mistake. That a policy of no policy is the way of a free society, the way we should treat free men and women, not as children, gormless fools, whom we are going to m manipulate with the interest rate or other policies. Someone, I forget who it was, spoke of the inescapable role of the government in the end of the last session. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. I see that. I think not. I think the problem with the inescapable role, there are lots of problems with the inescapable role of the government. One is the government. The, 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 as Burns said, well, what a parcel of robes in a nation. The, the government is not pure and wonderful. Um, economists, although I love and honor my, my economist colleagues, it's a collection of people, not all corrupt, but not all wise either. So what we need to do, I think, by way of advising our, our, our fellow citizens, is what economists talked about in the 18th in the 19th century, what Adam Smith talked about. Um, we need to encourage the creativity of a free society, not to dominate people, not to manipulate people. I mean, among the dangers, many dangers, is that if they're, if they're treated as children, they start acting like uh, children. And I think that's been a, uh, a problem in economic policy for a long time, that people think, ordinary people think of, them, th think of the government as the source of wealth, and that uh, uh, they should demand of the government that it, that it make them rich. This <laughs> most extreme case is Venezuela, where she is taxed to give a subsidy to him, He's taxed to give a subsidy to him. He's taxed to give a subsidy to her. And of course, we'll all be much better off. And this is not very intelligent. Smith talked about the man of system, who imagines that he can organize the forces of society as easily as someone moves a chess piece around a chessboard. Economics has been a policy science for about 100 years. Before that, I think it's fair to say that economics was mainly descriptive and philosophical, saying things like, well, it's a nice idea to have markets. Maybe that's smart. Let's do that. 
but not intervening in detail in the economy. Since the 1930s especially. Now, one justification of this policy science that we're talking about at this conference is something I hear in most of the papers here, which is the what we could call the proliferation of imperfections. I have a, a paper in which I count out fully 108 alleged imperfections in the economy by economics since 1848. Now the sociology here, the academic sociology, is that the way you make your reputation in economics is by coming up with a new imperfection. Thus, uh, my friend George Akerlof, um, uh, informational asymmetries. It's rather similar to solution concepts in game theory, 120 solution concepts in counting. In the, in, in the paper, I make the surprising assertion, here you'll resist it, but I urge you to consider the possibility it might be correct, that none of them, none of these 180 imperfections have been shown to be important, really important really challenging the uh, economy of free people. How do I make such a strange assertion? I said that I love and respect my colleagues in economics and in other social science fields, and in English and French too, and they, they think they've shown that monopoly or informational asymmetry, or whatever it is, is big in the economy, and that we economists know how to solve it. Um, the kind of er figure here is A.C. Pigou, with his book, The Economics of, ooh, of the, 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 the Welfare, where he talked about it, what he didn't call it externalities, but he called it increasing returns, and that was to be the big new thing. In behavioral economics, which has been mentioned, you, you may not know this, but if you consult the Wikipedia page on cognitive biases, you'll discover that there are 257 of them that psychologists have identified. If there are 257 important cognitive biases that really very greatly affect our personal behavior, it's a miracle we can walk across the room. It's a miracle that I don't fall off this, this uh, diet. It's a miracle that we can speak or do anything. 257. Now, I'm an economic historian, and I'm here to help you. To, to overcome your, your pessimism, which is the basis of this conviction that there are all these terrible imperfections, and we as economists are assigned to fix them. By the way, notice, some people have mentioned anthropology here. I know lots of anthropologists. I know lots of anthropologists' friends, and I'm worried about anthropology. They never say that. They study their tribe or their society, and they don't presume to advise the society on how to improve its kinship system. <laughs> Whereas we are at the other extreme in the social sciences of we not only know what's wrong with your economy, but we know how to um, fix it. <clears throat> Uh, it's been said here that things have gone wrong. Now, I know that you believe that things have gone wrong. It's, there's a general atmosphere of, of pessimism and, and despair in this room. Um, and I know that you believe that wages, for example, real wages have stagnated. You say, well, of course they've stagnated. 
excited. And it says so on TV. What, what? And I know you believe that artificial intelligence is special, that it's a completely new thing. I don't suppose it's ever occurred to you that a bow and arrow is a piece of artificial intelligence. It's a machine for calculating how to throw a small spear. That's what a bow and arrow is. And so, for thousands of human innovations. So, I know you have this, this pessimism. I know you won't be impressed by what an economic historian has to say. But as Oliver Cromwell said to the, to the presbyters of the, of the uh, Scottish Kirk before invading <laughs> Scotland, it's a somewhat shocking sentence, but lots of people know it. Think it possible in the bowels of Christ that you may be mistaken. Think it possible in the bowels of Christ that you may be mistaken. I think that static optimality, which is how we characterize so-called neoclassical economics, which by the way is much better called Samuelsonian economics, because my mother's long-term mixed doubles tennis partner, Paul Anthony Samuels, in case you needed to know that. Um, I, th that's his view and his brother-in-law, Kenneth Arrow, in case you don't know that. Uh, theirs is about optimality, about great optimality. But I think that it's slightly beside the point. And the reason is that since 1848, or 1876, to take that great symbolic year, income per head in Britain has increased by a factor of 30. By a factor of 30. <laughs> I gave a talk on all this to the Social Anthropology Department at Cambridge. I was talking to our colleague about this. And uh, I said, I kept vacillating between factor of 30 and 3,000%, which is what a factor of 30 is. And someone stood up, I won't reveal his name, and said, yeah, I understand your factor of 30, I agree, there's been a big change. But 3,000% is much too big. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't say, go back to the fourth form here. Uh, I slid over it to try to. But 3,000% is the payoff of modern economic growth. It's the, th this is something that Smith wouldn't possibly have been able to anticipate. He understood the nature and cause of the wealth of nations to be, maybe the highlands of Scotland can become as wealthy as Holland, which was his, his uh, standard for excellence in economics. And Smith, started us off on this idea of thinking that investment and allocation investment is the key to everything. 3,000%, bear that in mind. You know, if, if, if that's imperfection, we need more imperfections. If, if these terrible errors in the economy yield 3,000% for average and poor people in Scotland, maybe we not, shouldn't worry too much about exact Pareto optimality, which we can show on a blackboard, but that doesn't show that it's important. All right, um, let me make a very specific point on this score about the economists and the engineers core idea of the supply chain or the production function or the input output coefficient. I was a big input output maven when I was a graduate student. Or structure, as our friends the Marxists say. What Paul Sanderson called a book of recipes. That's the production function. Now, it's of course true that this idea of a production function is uh, it's very nice, and I used it for, for decades to do economic history, apply it to economic history. 
But understand that the idea of a production function is an accounting convention. It's about what the numbers are right now, thus fixed coefficient production functions in an input-output analysis. And you could make it Cobb Douglas or CES or, or whatever you want, but the same thing holds. Ask yourself, where does these recipes, where does the book of recipes come from? And the answer is that it comes from human creativity. But if we're explaining modern economic growth, or any economic growth, this extraordinary, completely unique event of the last two centuries, we need to understand where the recipes came from. If all we do is follow the recipes, then tomorrow will be the same as yesterday. We will not advance. It's nice, we'll, we won't necessarily deteriorate, but we won't advance. And the, there has to be behind the, the, the book of recipes, ideas. Ideas for opening a new chippy on, on Princess Street. It's not just fancy ideas like the steam engine. It's also ordinary ideas of some, some, some woman who thinks to open a hairdressing salon in her neighborhood. But it is also the fancy ones, and it's not just technological, it's not just machines, it's also organizational. I keep forgetting to write down when I think of a new organizational change that revolutionized production that involved no mechanical discovery, no biological discovery. But my favorite I can, I can give is containerization. Invented in 1956 by a man in North Carolina named Malcolm McLean a Scot, very appropriately, although he wasn't immediately Scottish before. And containerization is just an idea. It's just organization. It's not some technological miracle. It's not like, I don't know, uh, uh, the, the, the computer chip. It's, well, let's make big boxes out of cheap steel and pile them on top of each other and put Japanese stuff in it and send it to um, California. Now, it's blindingly obvious, actually, <clears throat> that ideas lay behind advance, progress, increasing income per head. Because if you don't have a new idea, the capital investment or the labor training is useless. I, the, the, the error here is, that, is to think that it's capital that makes us rich. And alas, this is something that Adam Smith started, and then Marx and, and others followed it. That capital accumulation is how we got rich. Human capital or physical capital doesn't matter. But that's wrong. As Bill Easterly says about his experience at the World Bank, capital fundamentalism, which was the policy capital output ratios in the 1950s and 60s that I was trained in, we pour capital into Ghana, and of course Ghana will do very well. We'll give those people we call the red Chinese not a cent, and they'll of course uh, won't, won't develop. Well, the opposite was true. So it's not, it's not just piling capital on capital that makes us rich, it's new ideas. Express it this way. Think of an old fashioned mechanical watch. The gears are the institutions we talk about, the capital we talk about, they're all necessary. The labor force we talk about, yeah, I, I get it, they're all necessary. But they're nothing like sufficient. The gears, once there's an impulsive force, make the watch run. But the spring is the impulsive force, not the gears. And the spring, I say, was liberalism. 
The idea that Adam Smith articulated, call it the obvious and simple system of natural liberty. The, he called it, he said, the, the liberal plan of social equality, the adjectives are nine, social equality, um, uh, uh, enterprise, um, uh, uh, freedom, able to enter hairdressing or whatever it is you want, and legal justice. Um, that was the spring. It was entirely new. And it's hard to get, get to feel that in your pulse. Because now we just assume, you know, in, in, in 1685, a man named Richard Rumbold was hanged in order of a judge of James II. He was a, he, he had been in the 40s, 1640 a leveler, radical, um, and finally the, the government caught up with him and hanged him. And of course, under English law, you're allowed to have a speech for the scaffold. He gave a speech in which he said, I think there is no man born of God above another. For none comes into the world with a saddle on his back, neither any booted or spurred to ride him. Now, in 1685, that must have caused hilarity in the crowd gathered to watch the hanging. Uh, that was the sort of little reality TV at the time, was to, was to go around and watch someone be hanged. But 100 years later, it had been, uh, become a cliche among advanced intellectuals like like Smith or Thomas Paine or Mary Wilson, um, and it it made it freed people from ancient hierarchies. Not immediately. It was extremely slow. It was still going on. It's only recently in Northern Europe that that gays have been freed from a terribly oppressive illegality. For, for their loves. Um, blacks in the United States are still, uh, um, still discriminated against, et cetera, et cetera. It's slow. Women in the United States didn't get the vote until 1919, et cetera. But it, it's going in that direction. And that made for enrichment. Because it made ordinary people think, well, he expressed it in one word, it made ordinary people bold. And I have lots of, by the way, these are, the, these are two of the three books that make this argument in detail. You must rush down your Amazon account and buy them. I don't care if you read them, just so you buy them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it, the, Economics has been off on the wrong tangent. It's become this policy science based on the notion of a, peru, of a peru production function, when what matters is the source of the ideas, and what matters for the amazingly creative society we have is, is, is freedom for people, ordinary individuals. Now, as for, let me just end on, on uh, a factual point about um, capital stranding. Capital stranding is how creative destruction works. In that alarming phrase, it wasn't actually Schumpeter's, he stole it from someone else, but he, he made it famous. And here's a fact, which is not widely known and should be in economics more. Every year in a dynamic economy, Britain, the United States, 14% of the job slots disappear forever. 14% disappear forever. The companies that have the job slots go bankrupt. They get merged and those job slots are taken away. They move to another part of the country inconvenient to the current labor force. There's an innovation that makes them um, uh, unnecessary, that is the low workforce. 
The most spectacular long-term example of this is, is agriculture. In 1800, still in Britain, a third uh, of the labor force was in agriculture. At the time, in 1800, 80% of the American labor force was in agriculture. Britain rapidly moved to virtually zero, and in the United States now, 1% of the labor force is in agriculture. Those jobs vanished forever. So that's how it works. And in order for such an economy to work well, well, you look, here's, here's a practical problem, and I'll end with this. If 14% of the jobs disappear every year, it's a fool's errand to protect the jobs. It's a fool's errand to offer retraining of the sort that the government regularly doesn't know how to do. It's a fool's errand to keep people in, in coal mining longer than they should. And this would be how an ideal socialist planner would work. It was sort of a blackboard conclusion of the great debate over socialism in the 20s and 30s, intellectually, that an ideal socialist community of planners reproduces what a flawless um, market would produce. Why is this? Well, I don't need to go into the details, but it is that what people are complaining about when they say, oh, we should keep the coal miners, is not capitalism. It's progress. It's improvement. So we must restrain ourselves. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be charitable. But if we're going to be philosophically consistent, we, you know, 14% makes it very, if it was 1%, that would be another matter. But 14%, if you, if you subsidize those jobs, uh, results in quickly half of the labor force being kept in the old jobs. And the life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Thank you very much.